Section 25 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. Martin. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1, Section 25, Selected Works, by Grace Aguilar. Grace Aguilar, 1816-1847 Fifty years ago a Jewish writer of English fiction was a new and interesting figure in English literature. Disraeli, indeed, had flashed into the literary world with Coningsby, that elegant vindication of the Jewish race. His grandiose Tancred had revealed to an astonished public the strange life of the desert of the mysterious vastness whence swept forth the tribes who became the Moors of Spain and the Jews of Palestine. Disraeli, however, stood in no category and established no precedent. But when Miss Aguilar's stories began to appear, they were eagerly welcomed by a public with whom she had already won reputation and favor as the defender and interpreter of her faith. The youngest child of a rich and refined household, Grace Aguilar was born in 1816 at Hackney, near London, of that historic strain of Spanish-Jewish blood, which for generations had produced not only beauty and artistic sensibility, but intellect. Her ancestors were refugees from persecution, and in her burned that ardor of faith which persecution kindles. Fragile and sensitive, she was educated at home by her cultivated father and mother, under whose solicitous training she developed an alarming precocity. At the age of twelve she had written a heroic drama on her favorite hero, Gustavus Vasa. At fourteen she had published a volume of poems. At twenty-four she accomplished her chief work on the Jewish religion, The Spirit of Judaism, a book republished in America with preface and notes by a well-known rabbi, Dr. Isaac Leeser of Philadelphia. Although the Orthodox priest found much in the book to criticize, he was forced to commend its ability. It insists on the importance of the spiritual and moral aspects of the faith delivered to Abraham, and deprecates a superstitious reverence for the mere letter of the law. It presents Judaism as a religion of love, and the Old Testament as the inspiration for the teachings of Jesus. Written more than a half-century ago, the book is widely read today by students of the Jewish religion. Four years later, Miss Aguilar published The Jewish Faith, Its Spiritual Consolation, Moral Guidance, and Immortal Hope, and The Women of Israel, a series of essays on biblical history, which was followed by essays and miscellaneous. So great was the influence of her writings that the Jewesses of London gave her a public testimonial and addressed her as the first woman who had stood forth as the public advent of the faith of Israel. While on her way to visit a brother then residing at Swalbach, Germany, she was taken ill at Frankfurt and died there at the early age of thirty-one. The earliest and the best known of Miss Aguilar's novels is Home Influence, which rapidly passed through thirty editions and is still a favorite book with young girls. There is little incident in the story, which is the history of the development of character in a household of six or seven young persons of very different endowments and tendencies. It was the fashion of the day to be didactic, and Mrs. Hamilton, from whom the home influence radiates, seems to the modern reader somewhat inclined to preach, in season and out of season. But the story is interesting, and the characters are distinctly individualized, while at least one episode is dramatically treated. The Mother's Recompense is a sequel to Home Influence, wherein the further fortunes of the Hamilton family are so set forth that the worldly-minded reader is driven to the inference that the brilliant marriages of her children are a sensible part of Mrs. Hamilton's recompense. The story is vividly and agreeably told. Of a different order is The Days of Bruce, a historic romance of the late thirteenth century which is less historic than romantic, and in whose mirror the rugged chieftain would hardly recognize his angularities. 
The Vale of Cedars is a historic tale of the persecution of the Jews in Spain under the Inquisition. It is told with intense feeling, with much imagination, and with a strong love of local color. It is said that family traditions are woven into the story. This book, as well as Home Influence, had a wide popularity in a German version. In reading Grace Aguilar, it is not easy to believe her the contemporary of Courier Bell and George Eliot. Both her manner and her method are earlier. Her lengthy and artificial periods, the rounded and decorative sentences that she puts into the mouths of her characters under the extremest pressure of emotion or suffering, the italics, the sentimentalities, are of another age than the sinewy English and hard sense of Jane Eyre or Adam Beatty. Doubtless her peculiar, sheltered training, her delicate health, and a luxuriant imagination that had seldom been measured against the realities of life account for the old-fashioned air of her work. But however antiquated the form may become, the substance of all her tales is sweet and sound, their charm for young girls is abiding, their atmosphere is pure, and the spirit that inspires them is touched only to find issues. The citation from The Days of Bruce illustrates her narrative style, that from women's friendship, her habit of disquisition, and the passage from home influence, her rendering of conversation. THE GREATNESS OF FRIENDSHIP FROM WOMEN'S FRIENDSHIP It is the fashion to deride women's influence over women, to laugh at female friendship, to look with scorn on all those who profess it. But perhaps the world at large little knows the effect of this influence. How often the unformed character of a young, timid, and gentle girl may be influenced for good or evil by the power of an intimate female friend. There is always, to me, a doubt of the warmth the strength and purity of her feelings when a young girl merges into womanhood, passing over the threshold of actual life, seeking only the admiration of the other sex, watching, pining for a husband or lovers, perhaps, and looking down on all female friendship as romance and folly. No young spirit was ever yet satisfied with the love of nature. Friendship, or love, gratifies self-love for it tacitly acknowledges that we must possess some good qualities to attract beyond the mere love of nature. Coleridge justly observes that it is well ordered that the amiable and estimable should have a fainter perception of their own qualities than their friends have, otherwise they would love themselves. Now, friendship or love permits their doing this unconsciously. Mutual affection is a tacit avowal and appreciation of mutual good qualities. Perhaps friendship yet more than love, for the latter is far more an aspiration, a passion than the former, and influences the permanent character much less. Under the magic of love, a girl is generally in a feverish state of excitement, often in a wrong position, deeming herself the goddess, her lover the adorer, whereas it is her will that must bend to his herself be abnegated for him. Friendship neither permits the former nor demands the latter. It influences silently, often unconsciously. Perhaps its power is never known till years afterwards. A girl who stands alone without acting or feeling friendship is generally a cold, unamiable being, so wrapped up in self as to have no room for any person else except, perhaps, a lover, whom she only sees and values as offering his devotion to that same idol, self. Female friendship may be abused, may be but a name for gossip, letter-writing, romance, nay worse, for absolute evil. But that Shakespeare, the mighty wizard of human hearts, thought highly and beautifully of female friendship. We have his exquisite portraits of Rosalind and Celia, Helen and the Countess, undeniably to prove, and if he who could portray every human passion, every subtle feeling of humanity, from the overwhelming tempest of love to the fiendish influences of envy and jealousy and hate, from the incomprehensible mystery of Hamlet's wondrous spirit to the simplicity of the gentle Miranda, the dove-like innocence of Ophelia, who could be crushed by her weight of love but not reveal it, if Shakespeare scorned not to picture the sweet influences of female friendship, shall women pass by it as a theme too tame, too idle for their pens? 
The Order of Knighthood from the Days of Bruce A right noble and glorious scene did the great hall of the palace present the morning which followed this eventful night. The king, surrounded by his highest prelates and nobles, mingling and indiscriminately with the high-born dames and maidens of his court, all splendidly attired, occupied the upper part of the hall, the rest of which was crowded by both his military followers and many of the good citizens of Scone, who flocked in great numbers to behold the august ceremony of the day. Two immense oaken doors at the south side of the hall were flung open, and through them was discerned the large space forming the palace yard, prepared as a tilting ground, where the new maiden knights were to prove their skill. The storm had given place to a soft, breezy morning, the cool freshness of which appeared peculiarly grateful from the oppressiveness of the night. Light downy clouds sailed over the blue expanse of heaven, tempering without clouding the brilliant rays of the sun. Every face was clothed with smiles, and the loud shouts which hailed the youthful candidates for knighthood, as they severally entered, told well the feeling with which the patriots of Scotland were regarded. Some twenty youths received the envied honor at the hand of their sovereign that day, but our limits forbid a minute scrutiny of the bearing of any, however well-deserving, save of the two whose vigils have already detained us so long. A yet longer and louder shout proclaimed the appearance of the youngest scoin of the house of Bruce and his companion. The daring patriotism of Isabella of Buchan had enshrined her in every heart, and so disposed all men toward her children that the name of their traitorous father was forgotten. Led by their godfathers, Nigel by his brother-in-law, Sir Christopher Seaton, and Alan by the Earl of Lennox, their swords, which had been blessed by the abbot at the altar, slung round their necks, they advanced up the hall. There was a glow on the cheek of the young Alan, in which pride and modesty were mingled. His step at first was unsteady, and his lip was seen to quiver from very bashfulness, as he first glanced round the hall and felt that every eye was turned upon him. But when that glance met his mother's fixed on him, and breathing that might of love that filled her heart, all boyish tremors fled, the calm, staid resolve of manhood took the place of the varying glow upon his cheek. The quivering lip became compressed and firm, and his step faltered not again. The cheek of Nigel Bruce was pale, but there was firmness in the glance of his bright eye, and a smile unclouded in its joyance on the lips. The frivolous lightness of the courtier, the mad bravado of knight-errantry, which was not uncommon to the times, indeed were not there. It was the quiet courage of the resolved warrior, the calm of a spirit at peace with itself, shedding its own high feeling and poetic glory over all around him. On reaching the foot of King Robert's throne, both youths knelt and laid their sheathed swords at his feet. Their armor-bearers then approached, and the ceremony of clothing the candidates in steel commenced. The golden spur was fastened on the left foot of each by his respective godfather, while Althal, Hay, and other nobles advanced to do honor to the youths by aiding in the ceremony. Nor was it warriors alone. "'Is this permitted, lady?' demanded the king, smiling, as the Countess of Buchan approached the martial group, and, aided by Lennox, fastened the polished cuirass in the form of her son. "'Is it permitted for a matron to arm a youthful knight? Is there no maiden to do such inspiring office?' "'Yes, when the knight is one like this, my liege,' she answered, in the same tone. "'Let a matron arm him.' "'Good, my liege,' she added sadly, "'let a mother's hand enwrap his boyish limbs in steel. "'A mother's blessing mark him thine and Scotland's, "'that those who watch his bearing in the battlefield "'may know who sent him there, "'may thrill his heart with memories of her "'who stands alone of her ancestral line, "'that though he bears the name of Commune, "'the blood of Fife flows reddest in his veins.' "'Arm him and welcome, noble lady,' answered the king." and a buzz of approbation ran through the hall. And may the noble spirit and dauntless loyalty inspire him. We shall not need a trusty follower while such as he are around us. Yet in very deed my youthful knight must have a lady fair for whom he tilts to-day. Come hither, Iseline. Thou lookest fairly inclined to envy thy sweet friend her office, and nothing loath to have a loyal knight thyself. 
Come, come, my pretty one. No blushing now. Lennox, guide those tiny hands aright. Laughing and blushing, Isoline, the daughter of Lady Campbell, a sister of the Bruce, a graceful child of some thirteen summers, advancing nothing loth to obey her uncle's summons, and an arch smile of real enjoyment irresistibly stole over the countenance of Alan, dispersing the emotion his mother's words produced. "'Nay, tremble not, sweet one,' the king continued, in a lower and yet kinder tone, as he turned from the one youth to the other, and observed that Agnes, overpowered by emotion, had scarcely power to perform her part. Despite the whispered words of encouraging affection, Nigel murmured in her ear, one by one, the cuirass and shoulder-pieces, the greaves and gauntlets, the gorget and brassards, the joints of which were so beautifully burnished that they shone as mirrors, and so flexible that every limb had its free use, enveloped those manly forms. Their swords once again girt to their sides, and once more kneeling, the king descended from his throne, alternately dubbing them knight in the name of God, St. Michael, and St. George. THE CULPRIT AND THE JUDGE FROM HOME INFLUENCE Mrs. Hamilton was seated at one of the tables on the dais nearest the Oriel window, the light from which fell on her, giving her figure, though she was seated naturally enough in one of the large maroon velvet oaken chairs, an unusual effect of dignity and command, and impressing the terrified beholder with such a sensation of awe that had her life depended on it, she could not for that one minute have gone forward and even when desired to do so by the words, I had desired your presence, Ellen, because I wished to speak to you, come here without any more delay. How she walked the whole length of that interminable room, and stood facing her aunt, she never knew. Mrs. Hamilton, for a full minute, did not speak, but she fixed that searching look to which we have once before alluded upon Ellen's face, and then said in a tone which, though very low and calm, expressed as much as that earnest look. Ellen, is it necessary for me to tell you why you are here, necessary to produce the proof that my words are right, and that you have been influenced by the fearful effects of some unconfessed and most heinous sin? Little did I dream its nature. For a moment Ellen stood as turned to stone, as white and rigid, the next she had sunk down with a wild, bitter cry at Mrs. Hamilton's feet, and buried her face in her hands. Is it true, can it be true, that you, offspring of my own sister, dear to me, cherished by me as my own child, you have been the guilty one to appropriate and conceal the appropriation of money, which has been a source of distress by its loss, and the suspicion thence proceeding for the last seven weeks? that you could listen to your uncle's words, absolving his whole household as incapable of a deed which was actual theft, and yet, by neither word nor sign, betray remorse or guilt, could behold the innocent suffering, the fearful misery of suspicion, loss of character, without the power of clearing himself, and stand calmly, heedlessly by, only proving by your hardened and rebellious temper that all was not right within? Ellen, can this be true? Yes, was the reply, but with such a fearful effort that her slight frame shook as with an og. Thank God that it is known. I dared not bring the punishment on myself, but I can bear it. This is mere mockery, Ellen. How dare, I believe, even this poor evidence of repentance, with a recollection of your past conduct? What were the notes you found? Ellen named them. Where are they? This is but one and the smallest. Ellen's answer was scarcely audible. Used them, and for what? There was no answer, neither then nor when Mrs. Hamilton sternly reiterated the question. Then she demanded, How long have they been in your possession? Five or six weeks, but the reply was so tremulous it carried no conviction with it. Since Robert told his story to your uncle, or before? Before. Then your last answer was a falsehood, Ellen. It is a full seven weeks since my husband addressed the household on the subject. You could not have so miscounted time with such a deed to date by. Where did you find them? Ellen described the spot. 
And what business had you there? You know that neither you nor your cousins are ever allowed to go that way to Mrs. Langsford's cottage, and more especially alone. If you wanted to see her, why did you not go the usual way? And when was this? You must remember the exact day. Your memory is not, in general, so treacherous. Again Ellen was silent. Have you forgotten it? She crouched lower at her aunt's feet, but the answer was audible. No. Then answer me, Ellen, this moment and distinctly. For what purpose were you seeking Mr. Langford's cottage by that forbidden path, and when? I, I wanted money, and I went to ask her to take my trinkets, my watch, if it must be, and dispose of them as I had read of others doing, as miserable as I was, and the wind blew the notes to my very hand, and I used them. I was mad then. I have been mad since, I believe, but I would have returned the whole amount to Robert if I could have but parted with my trinkets in time. To describe the tone of utter despair, the recklessness as to the effect of her words would produce, is impossible. Every word increased Mrs. Hamilton's bewilderment and misery. To suppose that Ellen did not feel was folly. It was the very depth of wretchedness which was crushing her to earth. But every answered and unanswered question but deepened the mystery, and rendered her judge's task more difficult. And when was this, Ellen? I will have no more evasion. Tell me the exact day. But she asked in vain. Ellen remained moveless and silent as the dead. After several minutes, Mrs. Hamilton removed her hands from her face, and compelling her to lift up her head, gazed certainly on her death-like countenance for some moments in utter silence, and then said, in a tone that Ellen never in her life forgot, "'You cannot imagine, Ellen, that this half-confession will either satisfy me or in the smallest degree redeem your sin. One, and one only path is open to you, for all that you have said and left unsaid but deepened your apparent guilt, and so blackened your conduct, that I can scarcely believe I am addressing the child I so loved, and could still so love, if but one real sign be given of remorse and penitence, one hope of returning truth. But that sign, that hope, can only be a full confession. Terrible as is the guilt of appropriating so large a sum, granted it came by the merest chance into your hand, Dark as is the additional sin of concealment, while an innocent person was suffering, something still darker, more terrible, must be concealed behind it, or you would not, could not, continue this obdurately silent. I can believe that under some heavy pressure of misery, some strong excitement, the sum might have been used without thought, and that fear might have prevented the confession of anything so dreadful. But what was this heavy necessity for money, this strong excitement, what fearful and mysterious difficulties have you been led into to call for either? Tell me the truth, Ellen, the whole truth. Let me have some hope of saving you and myself the misery of publicly declaring you the guilty one, and so proving Robert's innocence. Tell me what difficulty, what misery so maddened you, so as to demand the disposal of your trinkets. If there be the least excuse... The smallest possibility of your obtaining in time forgiveness, I will grant it. I will not believe you so utterly fallen. I will do all I can to remove error and yet to prevent suffering, but to win this I must have a full confession. Every question that I put to you must be clearly and satisfactorily answered, and so bring back the only comfort to yourself and hope to me. Will you do this, Ellen? Oh, that I could, was the reply in such bitter anguish. Mrs. Hamilton actually shuddered. But I cannot, must not, dare not, Aunt Emmeline. Hate me, condemn me to the severest, sharpest suffering. I wish for it, pine for it. You cannot loathe me more than I do myself. But do not, do not speak to me in these kind tones. I cannot bear them. It was because I knew what a wretch I am that I have so shunned you. I was not worthy to be with you. Oh, sentence me at once. I dare not answer as you wish. Dare not, repeated Mrs. Hamilton, more and more bewildered, and, to conceal the emotion Ellen's wild words and agonized manner had produced, adopting a greater sternness. You dare commit a sin from which the lowest of my household would shrink in horror, and yet you dare not make the only atonement? Give me the only proof of real penitence, I demand? 
This is a weak and wicked subterfuge, Ellen, and will not pass with me. There can be no reason for this fearful obduracy, not even the consciousness of greater guilt. For I promise forgiveness, if it be possible, on the sole condition of a full confession. Once more, will you speak? Your hardihood will be utterly useless, for you cannot hope to conquer me, and if you permit me to leave you with your conduct still clothed and in this impenetrable mystery, you will compel me to adopt measures to subdue the defying spirit which will expose you and myself to intense suffering, but which must force submission at last. You cannot inflict more than I have endured the last seven weeks, murmured Ellen, almost inarticulately. I have borne that. I can bear the rest. Then you will not answer? You are resolved not to tell me the day on which you found that money, the use to which it was applied, the reason of your choosing that forbidden path, permitting me to believe you guilty of heavier sins than may be the case in reality? Listen to me, Ellen. It is more than time this interview should cease, but I will give you one chance more. It is now half-past seven. She took the watch from her neck and laid it on the table. I will remain here one half-hour longer. By that time this sinful temper may have passed away, and you will consent to give me the confession I demand. I cannot believe you so altered in two months as to choose obduracy and misery when pardon and in time confidence and love are offered in their stead. Get up from that crouching posture. It can be but mock humility, and so only aggravate your sin. Ellen rose slowly and painfully and seating herself at the table some distance from her aunt, leaned her arms upon it and buried her face within them. Never before and never after did half an hour appear so interminable to either Mrs. Hamilton or Ellen. It was well for the firmness of the former, perhaps, that she could not read the heart of that young girl, even if the cause of its anguish had been still concealed. Again and again did the wild longing, turning her actually faint and sick with its agony, come over her to reveal the whole, to ask but rest and mercy for herself, pardon and security for Edward. But then, clear as if held before her in letters of fire, she read every word of her brother's desperate letter, particularly, breathe it to my uncle or aunt, for if she knows it, he will, and you will never see me more. Her mother, pallid as death, seemed to stand before her, freezing confession on her heart and lips, looking at her threateningly, as she had so often seen her, as if the very thought were guilt. The rapidly advancing twilight, the large and lonely room, all added to that fearful illusion, and if Ellen did succeed in praying, it was with desperate fervor for strength not to betray her brother. If ever there were a martyr spirit, it was enshrined in that young, frail form. Aunt Emmeline, Aunt Emmeline, speak to me but one word, only one word of kindness before you go. I do not ask for mercy. There can be none for such a wretch as I am. I will bear without one complaint, one murmur, all you may inflict. You cannot be too severe. Nothing can be such agony as this utter loss of your affection. I thought the last two months that I feared you so much that it was all fear, no love. But now, now that you know my sin, it has all, all come back to make me still more wretched. And before Mrs. Hamilton could prevent, or was in the least aware of her intention, Ellen had obtained possession of one of her hands and was covering it with kisses, while her whole frame shook with those convulsed but completely tearless sobs. Will you confess, Ellen, if I stay? Will you give me the proof that it is such agony to lose my affection, that you do love me as you profess, that it is only one sin which has so changed you, one word, and, tardy as it is, I will listen, and I can forgive? Ellen made no answer, and Mrs. Hamilton's newly raised hopes vanished. She waited full two or three minutes, then gently disengaged her hand and dress from Ellen's still convulsive grasp. The door closed with a sullen, seemingly unwilling sound, and Ellen was alone. She remained in the same posture, the same spot, till a vague, cold terror so took possession of her 
that the room seemed filled with ghostly shapes, and all the articles of furniture suddenly transformed to things of life, and springing up with the wild fleet step of fear, she paused not till she found herself in her own room, where, flinging herself on her bed, she buried her face on her pillow to shut out every object. Oh, how she longed to shut out thought! End of section 25 Recorded by J. Martin